welcome. In this final session of our study on the Gospel of John, we will look at the resurrection narratives and the epilogue. John's account of the resurrection appearances of Jesus is the longest in the New Testament. There are two sets of narratives, one set in chapter 20 and the other often treated as an appendix or an epilogue in chapter 21. The ending, the last two verses of chapter 20, has the appearance of ending the gospel. Yet there are no surviving manuscripts of the Gospel of John that do not contain chapter 21. Moreover, chapter 21 addresses questions such as the final status of Peter, his relation to the beloved disciple, and the fate of both. In chapter 20, we read the story of Mary Magdalene in the empty tomb, Jesus' first appearances before the disciples, and the story of the doubting Thomas. But now we begin with a prayer. O God, our Father, open our eyes and enlighten our minds as we study your word. So grant that our minds may know your truth and our hearts may feel your love, and then confirm and strengthen our wills that we may go out to live what we have learned. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The commentaries that I presented in this series have primarily come from the Abingdon New Testament commentary on John by D. Moody Smith. Most of what I have said in these videos is either directly quoted from or paraphrased from his book. There is certainly much more in Smith's commentary than we could possibly touch on in the time allotted, and it is likely that from time to time some of my omissions could have skewed his original analysis. Where I have done that, it was not intentional. This is, after all, a church Bible study, uh, not a scholarly review. I have also occasionally quoted from the books of John Shelby Spong and Jamie Clark Souls, although I have primarily used their works as well as a few others in the handouts found on Northgate's website. The Gospel of John was written in Greek nearly 2,000 years ago by an unknown author or authors, and we have seen that there are multiple ways to interpret much of what John wrote and what his motivation was under what circumstances he wrote his Gospel. Smith, Spawn, and Clark Souls, while generally in agreement on the big picture items, don't always agree on all the little details. I think it can be useful to have more than one perspective, and so I have tried to present multiple, multiple perspectives in this series. Chapter 20 begins with the discovery of the empty tomb. All four of the Gospels, in fact, have a story of the discovery of the empty tomb by women or in the case of John, by a woman. Mary Magdalene is named in all four. So let's begin with chapter 20, verses 1 through 10. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. In the synoptics, the women go to the tomb to anoint the body of Jesus, but in John, this has already been done by Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. Mary has gone to the tomb alone and seen the stone rolled away. She immediately seeks out Simon Peter and perhaps the beloved disciple, here just called the other disciple mostly. Apparently she assumes that the grave robbers or vandals have been at work. Typically Peter is placed in a kind of rivalry with the other disciple or the beloved disciple, in which he always seems to come in second. Remember, it was the other disciple who knew the high priest and had to talk to the gatekeeper to allow Peter to get admitted into the courtyard. Here, the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. However, it was Peter 
who was the first to go inside. We are told that the other disciples saw and believed, but it's not clear what he believed, other than that the tomb was empty. They still did not understand that Jesus was going to rise from the dead, so they went back home. Let's read verses 11 through 14. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Now Mary stands outside the tomb as if the disciples, at least one of whom is seen and believed, had nothing further to say to her. In fact, we are not told that she even returned to the tomb with the disciples, although we assume that she did. It is strange that they seem to leave with not so much as a word to her. This is probably an indication that the episode of the disciples' visit has been inserted into an earlier narrative of Mary's discovery of the empty tomb. We could have gone from verse 1, where Mary discovered the stone removed, straight to verse 11, where she stood, stood weeping, and the narrative would still have made sense. At any rate, Mary has recognized that the body of Jesus is not in the tomb. She looks into the tomb and sees two angels sitting where the body should have been. She uses the same words she used with the disciples to explain that someone had taken the Lord away and she doesn't know where they have put him. As Mary turns, she sees Jesus. The narrative itself reaches a turning point. So we go to verse 15. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you were looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God, and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord, and she told them that he had said these things to her. Mary's momentary failure to recognize Jesus is comparable to the misunderstanding of Jesus found throughout this entire gospel. Jesus repeats the question of the angel and asks who she is seeking. Mary mistakes Jesus for the gardener, and for the third time indicates she thinks the body has been taken away. John makes the point more emphatically than the other Gospels that Jesus' resurrection was totally un unanticipated by his disciples and close followers. In the fourth Gospel, Jesus has only alluded to his resurrection in a veiled way, but never directly. In verse 16, Mary and Jesus address each other in what is one of the most memorable encounters in the history of literature. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni. Mary further learns that Jesus' permanent resurrection state will not be attained until he ascends to the Father, which he will now do. We go on to verse 19. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, then they are not forgiven. This scene has two significant counterparts. One is in the subsequent episode a week later in which Thomas, absent here, is present and demands proof. The other is a quite similar story in Luke 24, 36 through 43 in which the risen Jesus shows the disciples his hands and feet as proof of his identity as their crucified leader. 
This appearance takes place on the same day as the discovery of the empty tomb, that is, Easter Sunday. The disciples have locked the doors, as we again hear the refrain, the fear of the Jews. His greetings, peace be with you, has become traditional among Christians. His demonstration of his hands and sides is intended as proof of his, of his identity as the crucified one. As Jesus repeats the blessing of peace and sends the disciples as the Father sent him, the unity of Jesus with his Father and his followers is tied to the mission of the world. For this mission, the disciples receive empowerment and illumination. Jesus' bestowal of the Spirit upon the disciples is perhaps the culmination of the resurrection narrative. Curiously, the power of forgiving and retaining sins is bestowed upon the disciples in verse 23. However, we find that this power is primarily for inner community discipline. We also see here the imagery of breath or wind as he gives his disciples the Holy Spirit. Let's go to verse 24. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hand and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Thomas plays no significant role in the other Gospels, but is an important figure in John, where he raises a significant question for Jesus in chapter 14, the final discourses. Thomas's absence from the scene a week earlier is left unexplained, but allows for this episode full of theological meaning. Jesus does not call him Doubting Thomas, but encourages him to believe rather than doubt. Thomas believes uttering the fullest and most adequate Christological confession in this gospel, my Lord and my God. Not only is the piercing of the side unique to John, but according to the narrative of the gospel, only one disciple was in a position to witness it, the unnamed beloved disciple. There has been the suggestion that this episode points to Thomas as the beloved disciple. Thomas's sensitivity to the wound in Jesus' side, an injury not even mentioned in the other Gospels, might be an indicator that he indeed was the witness to the piercing of Jesus' side. In any event, Thomas, the disciple that once doubted, has made the confession that is central and true. Jesus is Lord and God. Let's go to verse 30 and 31. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And this, it would seem, is a fitting end to John's Gospel. We have a concluding statement and a statement of purpose. This has been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. Yet, of course, this is not the end. There is another chapter that we'll get to in a minute. It's interesting that the initial statement, which is perfectly clear, does not, however, seem to be quite appropriate in this context. Since the signs of Jesus have been his deeds, particularly his miracles done during his earthly public ministry, but there is no mention of his words, which have been quite extensive, especially in the dis discourses. There is also nothing included about the Passion narrative or the Resurrection. Whatever the origin of this statement, it is best taken as a summation of the entire gospel, not of Jesus' resurrection appearances. Jesus' ministry can be seen as a sequence of words, deeds, all signifying who he is. It's also interesting that the author uses the term book to apply to his work. What is noteworthy is that he does not use the word gospel, 
That term was not applied to these works until several decades later. Most commentators are inclined to view to the view that John, in its present form, was written for Christian consumption. It seems to have a primarily Christian readership in view. It is important for the author of this gospel that readers should believe that the Messiah is Jesus. But it is equally clear, as the narrative unfolds, that the traditional Jewish meaning of Messiahship is being transformed and extended almost beyond recognition, as it is suggested by the title Son of God. That title and all that it entails seriously qualifies, changes, and enriches the identification of Jesus as Messiah or Christ. It represents a development that is mainly inter-Christian and inner Johnian, as is clear from the very beginning of this gospel. John's fundamental goal and conviction is that through the name of Jesus, readers should gain life. What Jesus brings, the Gospel of John now brings, the possibility of life, eternal life, for the two are the same in John. We go now to chapter 21. Because the Gospel seems already to have ended, we have to regard this new chapter as a kind of appendix or an epilogue. Here we will see more resurrection appearances to the disciples in Jesus' dialogue with Peter by the sea. The conversation appears to resolve the obvious alienation of Peter, who has denied Jesus three times, as Peter affirms his love for Jesus three times in response to Jesus' insistent questioning. We begin with the first three verses. Afterward, Jesus appeared to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the son of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. This appearance by the sea that we read in chapter 21 does not require the previous appearance narratives in order to be understood. In fact, if anything, the previous appearances cause a problem, for as we shall see, this appearance seems unexpected. And if we hadn't already read about them, we would not think the disciples hadn't seen the risen Lord at all prior to this episode. Seven of the disciples are gathered back in Galilee. Why these disciples and not others are gathered is not said. We can only guess. Unlike Mark, nothing in John's gospel suggests that Jesus might appear in Galilee. And nothing in this narrative suggests that he has already appeared in Jerusalem. Peter said he is going to go fishing, and the others join him. The fact that the others join him suggests that they are simply going back to work, taking up their occupations where they left off in order to follow Jesus in the first place. Although John never actually told us the disciples had been fishermen. At any rate, they got in the boat and went out to fish that night. Of course, it was night and darkness and all that entails in the fourth gospel. Let's go on to verse 4. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, Throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the, disciples who, the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire burning of burning coals. There were fish on it and some bread. So Jesus is standing on the shore at dawn. He questions them, and they reply that they have had no success in catching fish. Then, following Jesus' instructions, they make an overwhelming catch. At this point, the beloved disciple recognizes Jesus and tells Peter who he is. Peter then jumps in the water and swims for shore. You may remember a similar story from Mark, where early in his ministry, the disciples were struggling to find any fish, and Jesus told them to cast their nets. As in this story, they were overloaded with fish. 
Jesus has prepared breakfast for the disciples and will feed them as he once fed the multitude of 5,000 by the sea. So Jesus has led his disciples to a great catch, and now he feeds them bread and fish. We go on to verse 10. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. The number of fish they caught was 153. That this number is given exactly is somewhat perplexing and presumably has some significance. Augustine observed that the number 1 through 17 add up to 153. But why this should be significant is not obvious. Many other suggestions have been made over the centuries. It may be that the exactness of the number is intended to substantiate the accuracy of the eyewitness to the event. The number supports the implication that the catch was large enough to break the nets, but didn't. It's also not clear why he suggested they bring some of the catch since he had already prepared breakfast. The recognition of the risen Jesus at mealtime is also an important resurrection theme. So we go on to verse 15. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. The conversation between Jesus and Peter is highly stylized and Johnny and Jesus repeatedly asks Peter whether he loves him and refers to his followers as sheep or lambs. The matchup between Peter's three denials and Jesus' threefold question can hardly be coincidental. While Peter is being sharply questioned, Jesus' commands also imply a pastoral role for him. Clearly, Peter is the leading figure among the Twelve in John as well as the other Gospels. In Roman Catholic tradition, he was the Bishop of Rome. While we cannot read this passage in the light of what position Peter later attained in the history and tradition of the Church, the development of these traditions has some basis in the writing of the New Testament and even in the career of the historical Peter, as this episode suggests. Jesus is the Good Shepherd, and Peter must emulate him. Love for Jesus means, first of all, obedience to Jesus' command to love one's fellow disciples. Why did Jesus ask in the first place? He is, of course, testing Peter's loyalty. Moreover, Peter denied Jesus three times, so he must affirm his love three times in order to strike a balance. Then Jesus proceeds to predict Peter's earthly destiny in words that are mysterious and therefore must be explained. This is probably our earliest reference to Peter's martyrdom. Eusebius reports that Peter was crucified upside down, a legend that has become famous. It's significant that Peter's death, like that of Jesus, glorifies God. We go on to verse 20. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. 
Because of this, the rumor spread among the believers that the disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? Peter now asks about the fate of his rival, who, with one exception, when Peter had deserted Jesus, always appears alongside him. Jesus' reference to his own return, however, raises a theological and, as it turns out, a practical question. In verse 23, the narrator steps in to explain, and his explanation reveals that Jesus' statement had created a problem. This needs to be viewed not only in a Johnian context, but in relation to early Christian eschatology generally. There had been an expectation of Jesus' imminent return. Here we are offered an invaluable insight into Johnian circles and the development of eschatological expectation and interpretation there. Peter has become a martyr. The beloved disciple was apparently not a martyr, but seems here to be identified as the one responsible for this gospel. Let's read verse 24. This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. So it's a good question. Who is speaking here? Is the narrator speaking as the author of the whole gospel of chapter 21 or only of this statement? Is the beloved disciple, the author, the one who actually wrote or the one who authorizes and authenticates what is written? It's not clear. Verse 25, Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. The final statement of the gospel clearly echoes chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. Yet in some ways it is different. In chapter 20, other signs are mentioned. Here, other things. So this refers to a broader range. Here, the writing of the books about Jesus is clearly contemplated. The epilogue addresses issues different from those central to the appearance scenes in chapter 20. The stories in chapter 20 deal with the reality of the resurrection itself and how the disciples and Mary acknowledge the news. In the epilogue, however, relationships between Peter and Jesus and then between Peter and the beloved disciple become matters of utmost concern and interest. The conversation between Jesus and Peter reassures the Johnny and community of the Apostles' reinstatement to good standing. At the same time, the beloved disciple is brought into the discussion by Peter's question. Jesus says, in effect, that Peter should attend to his own ministry. As we've said in our first session, the Gospel of John is one of the most mysterious books of the Bible. The author presents Jesus as both a mystic as well as a messiah. To the very end, we are teased with a mysterious, beloved disciple. Who was he? What role did he play in the composition of this gospel? In her book, Reading John for Dear Life, Jamie Clark Souls leaves until the appendix the story of how and under what circumstances the fourth gospel was written. The intra-Jewish debate in which the Christian Jews were excluded from the synagogue and the relationship of John's gospel to the insidious problem of anti-Semitism. John Shelby Spong introduced the Roman War, the intra-Jewish intra battles, and the different levels with which the narrative should be understood in the beginning of his book, The Fourth Gospel, Tales of a Jewish Mystic. D. Moody Smith has attempted to deal with all of these complexities and others too numerous to even list throughout his commentary. Reading and trying to understand the Gospel of John is not a walk in the park. It is a challenge. It's my hope that these videos and the accompanying handouts have been helpful in your understanding of the fourth gospel, and if not in understanding, at least in illuminating the issues and pointing to other sources that may help you in sorting out the complexities. Just perhaps, John might have achieved his objective of leading you to believe that you may have life in Jesus' name. Peace be with you.